Please open your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We did verse 1 last week, and we're going to pick up the pace. We're going to do three verses tonight. James 1, 2 through 4 is our passage for tonight. Let's pray. Let's pray as we get started. Dear God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that we get to sing these verses of these songs with joy and with gladness and with eagerness and not with dread. For, for many of us, we can sing these songs and eagerly anticipate the, the glory and the splendor and the joy and the satisfaction and the fulfillment of all of your creation plan when you send your son to return and stand upon this earth and establish his kingdom. That is joy indescribable. That is, that is the fullness of glory that we get to look forward to. And I pray that with that as our focus this evening, all of the situations in our life would be put into their proper place. And I pray that we would view our lives rightly from an eternal focus, from a kingdom focus. And I pray that you would give us joy even in today because of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, James wants to do two things. He wants to warn you about worldliness. He wants to warn you about a worldly kind of faith that will destroy you, cripple you, weaken you. He wants to warn you of the danger of worldly wisdom. But he also wants to woo you to the wonder of heavenly wisdom, to to woo you towards heavenly faith. He's going to make this contrast and say, this is what worldly faith looks like, and this is what heavenly faith looks like. Which one is yours? He's going to explain the differences, and then he's going to hold up the mirror of God's word and say, Who are you? Who are you? And remember, the first part of James that we're going to be focusing on for a few weeks is is basically all about trials and how trials, various trials, are God's means of growing true faith. But only as we respond correctly to them, as we will see tonight. But let's open our Bibles to James chapter 1, and let's consider our passage. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance, and let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Think about that first verse. What is James saying? If you're living, if you're breathing, think about this. What is James saying in verse 2? He's saying, consider various trials as all joy. I mean, if, if you're living, if you're breathing, you might be tempted to think, if you're honest with yourself, what is he saying? I'm supposed to be joyful about what? I'm supposed to be Happy about what various trials in my life I'm supposed to respond to with joy? James doesn't appear to be really in touch with reality, perhaps, maybe. And maybe, if if you're really honest, you're thinking, is it possible that, that James is not describing the real world? Is it possible that James is not describing the, the real world of following Christ that I live in? James is perhaps describing a different kind of world, a a, a, a made-up land. But this isn't the way real Christianity is. I I can't be joyful in everything. That is impossible. And a matter of fact, if you look at just a few Christian biographies, do you see continual, constant happiness? If if that's how you want to describe joy, do do you see do you see uh, an easy life in the face of trials? Do you see joy? For example, the apostle Paul, the apostle Paul, 
Would he be described as someone who had joy? Just think about all the things that the Apostle Paul went through. Well, first off, why, why did he do what he did? It was because he was convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be returning and establishing his kingdom. The wrath of God would be released on mankind at that point for the, for the judgment of sin and rebellion, and Jesus would establish his kingdom, just like we, we, we sang. And, and, and Paul was going out with great news of good joy, to help people, to, to, to tell them that there was a Savior who would deliver them from sin. Uh, Paul was seeking to do spiritual good for people. Uh, Paul was seeking to live purposely. And what happened in his life? Uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians tell us that he, he shared countless bad days. He was considered a laughingstock in the world, according to himself. He suffered weakness. He suffered hunger. He constantly had poor clothing, he tells us. Every missionary kid knows exactly what that's like, right? He also was beaten regularly. He was homeless. He was imprisoned numerous times. He was beaten. He was stoned at one point nearly to death. He was shipwrecked three times. He spent a whole night and a day out at sea. He suffered dangers on rivers from robbers, from Jews, and then from Gentiles. He suffered dangers when he was in cities, and then he also suffered dangers when he was out in the wilderness. He also suffered sleepless nights and was often very cold, he describes himself as. Now, was he happy in those moments? Or well, was that an easy thing for Paul? Or consider another uh, Christian biography. This is a missionary, one of my favorite missionaries. Consider John G. Patton, who was a missionary to the South Sea Islands um, in the 1900s, uh, mid-1900s. He was an energetic young missionary from Scotland who had a lot of eagerness to serve the Lord. Matter of fact, while he was in Scotland, he did incredible work to serve God. All he wanted to do, though, was be a missionary, and he didn't want anything to come between him and pursuing Christ's glory on the mission field. And so eventually, he sailed to the New Hebrides Islands, which are just north of uh, um, Australia, and he brought his young wife with him. His wife was 19 years old. Some of you are almost 19 years old. I should be looking over here. There's no wives over here. Our future, anyway. Anyway, um, they, they almost immediately after getting to the island of, of Tana, which was inhabited by cannibals, um, she would die. Within a year, she would die. But she didn't die because cannibals were hunting her down to kill her. No, she died because they put their cabin in the wrong place, and she contracted pneumonia and malaria. She died within a year. And the baby she was carrying died several weeks after. And you know what John Patton did after that? He dug their own grave, and then he buried them together in each other's arms, and then he covered the grave, and it was said that he would lay on the grave and sleep on the grave to keep the cannibals from digging up the bodies and eating them. And not only that, he spent days, weeks, months in grief, in sorrow, in tears over the loss of his entire family. He was a young man and completely now alone on the island of Tana. It was a constant theme for him to be sorrowful in those first four years of his ministry. But, and those are extreme examples. It doesn't always seem, does it, like following Jesus leads to happiness or joy in your life. It seems as though following Jesus makes your life difficult, adds problems to your life. And those are dramatic examples. We have our hands full with everyday issues of life to be joyful in, right? Sometimes the car won't start. For an adult, that's an issue. Uh, sometimes the weeds won't stop. Oftentimes the friend won't call you back, won't confess their sin that they were wrong, will live in, uh, uh, in antagonism towards you. Sometimes the pressure won't let up. Sometimes the anxiety won't stop. 
Sometimes sadness and hopelessness will not leave. Sometimes the church doesn't uplift you. Sometimes people don't stop in their cruelty towards you. Sometimes life is hard, life is painful. Various trials, James would say to us. But how can he say that? What world is James in? Uh, How can I be joyful in trials? How can I rejoice? And notice the language even here of of James 1 verse 2. He says, consider it all joy. Various trials, all joy. Or some translations say pure joy, joy unmixed, sheer joy, great joy, joy through and through, joy from first to last. What planet are you on, James? Tonight, I want to examine the Christian's joy. I want to examine the Christian's joy. And I want to explain what the Christian's joy looks like. But I, but I want to do it in kind of reverse. So, first off, we're going to look at the future. We're going to look at the future in verse 4. We're going to look at the end result, the outcome of trials. And then we're going to look at God's ongoing process of working on us in our trials through verse 3. And then we're going to come and define Christian joy in verse 2 and and explain what considering all joy looks like. But we're going to go in reverse because the best part is verse 2. And I really want to know what it means to consider all joy. That seems inconceivable to me. How, How can I do that? How can I do that in my everyday life? How can I do that in small things? Even small trials. So let's get started. Uh, first off, as we unpack and reverse, uh, number one, we are to we are to rejoice in the outcome of our trials. We are to rejoice in the end result of our trials. We are to rejoice in the outcome of trials. Verse four tells us this, right? Let perseverance have its perfect work so that we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the end result of our trials. Notice the description there. Let something have its perfect work. It's perfect work. Trials are are working, it seems to say, a a good work in you and a good work in me. They're, They're working a perfect work in us, in fact. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you tonight that you really, really want what trials will accomplish in your life. You really want it. You really want this outcome that we're going to talk about. When you see what trials produce in your life, you'll say, sign me up. As a matter of fact, if we could borrow from um, chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of change if we could say trials are coming from god then we could say trials are a good and a perfect gift from god just by looking at their end think about this you are in the hands of an all-powerful god And you are also in the hands of an all-wise God who knows exactly the circumstances and the situations you need to grow you and sanctify you. And he sends every good thing your way for your benefit. His hands are perfect in their work. His hands are highly skilled. They don't shake. They're not bumbling. They're not weak in how they work on you. And you see this by the end result. How many of you are Toy Story fans? Anybody? Toy Story is one of my favorite Pixar movies of all time, along with all the other Pixar movies. Almost. But, but there's this character that I love in the, in the movie Toy Story 2. Uh, he's also a main character in a Pixar short. Um, his name is, is it Jerry? Is that how you pronounce his name? The old man with the glasses and the dentures? Gurry, maybe? Uh, I think it's Jerry. But anyway, he's at that chess game. Remember, he's playing the chess game by himself, and then he finally gets the dentures back because he wins the chess game. But this character is also in Toy Story 2, if you have eyes to see it. He is the cleaner. 
You remember, of course, when, when Woody, the toy, the stuffed toy, gets his arm cut uh, or, or, or broken uh, while playing too, uh, too much with Andy, uh, that he basically gets uh, kind of confused and lost and garbled and thinks he's getting thrown away, and then he eventually goes over to this other guy, and this other guy realizes Woody's worth a ton of money, and he's going to fix him up, and he's going to sell him to this museum in Japan, and what happens first? He has to repair Woody's arm, otherwise he's not worth anything, and what happens? The cleaner shows up, and the door opens. It's this old man that's bent over, and I love the scene where uh, the man is kind of threading the needle. Uh, maybe You remember that? You can see you can see him threading the needle, and you can see Woody's eye, the a plastic do- tall uh, toy behind the hands, kind of like, you can almost imagine like Woody's looking at these hands and just shaking with fear. Why? Because these old hands are like shaking like this while they're trying to put the, the, the string through the needle, right? I don't want you anywhere near me with those hands and that needle. That's what Woody is saying in his head. But then what happens as soon as he starts working, skill, strength, precision, it, it is wonderful. This man is amazing at cleaning up this Woody doll. And I think about that when I think about trials in my life because often it feels as though God's hands are shaky. God's hands aren't going to work. God's hands are going to bumble me or drop me or break me or poke me in the wrong place and kill me. (laughs) But actually, in experience, God's hands are powerful and all-wise and perfect, and they do perfect work. I want you to remember that for a little bit later. But first off, let's ask a question. What is the final product of God's perfect, sanctifying work in your life and in my life? Uh, Through trials, what does God produce? You see three descriptions of the, the result of God's perfect work through trials. Notice, you become perfect. You become perfect, then you become complete, and then, say it all negatively, you are lacking in nothing. What does it mean? Perfect means to be fully grown, to to reach the end goal, to achieve the desired outcome. Complete means, it's, it's kind of a similar word, it's a parallel word, it means you're, you're not missing anything. You've got everything. You are whole. Every Every part that you need to be fully mature is there. And then, of course, he says all of this negatively by basically saying, lacking in nothing. There is nothing missing. You are fully grown. You are fully mature. Matter of fact, the, the, the verbal sense of lacking in nothing is really strong. You are continually resulting in lacking of nothing. You are continually sufficient. You are continually complete. You are continually mature. What is James describing here? He's describing, I believe, the existence of sanctification having its way in your life. You grow up. You mature. And I don't think James here is talking about being perfect as in a, a righteous standing before God. I think he's talking about being spiritually mature, growing up. In this world, for, for one reason why I think that is, is James in three in James three two, basically himself says nobody is perfect, and then in James two twenty two he says that Abraham, as a result of various testing, has his faith perfected. So I think what he's describing here is a mature faith. You grow up in your faith. You are mature, and, and here's a precious reminder. A precious reminder, sanctification is a great reward to those who are grown in it. Sanctification is something that you really want in your life. What is the result of sanctification in your life? It means peace is in your life. What is the result of sanctification? It means stability is in your life. You're unshakable. It means security is in your life. It means thankfulness is is full to the brim in your life. It also means usefulness. You are useful for Christ. And everyone knows you are peaceful. You are self-controlled. You are useful. You are a valuable commodity. And on top of that, you have a beautiful, deep communion and relationship with God. A sweet existence. Sanctification is God's end goal through trials. 
That is the outcome of trials. A few implications of this. Once again, you really want what God is working in you through various trials. You should say to yourself, I want this. All of my problems right now are from lacking elements, lacking qualities in my life, not being fully grown. That's where all of my problems are coming from. And second, another, another thought by way of application, I would suggest to you that considering your future joy will actually encourage your present endurance. Considering the future outcome of a trial will encourage you to persist in your present difficulty. By the way, the Bible is full of, of, of pointers this way. The Bible is always saying, you who are weak, you whose knees are weak and whose back is tired, whose spirit is downcast, look to the future, look to what God is doing. Romans 5 verse 3 says this, not only this, but we also boast in our afflictions. That's what Christians do. We boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame. To the point where a, a believer is even said to boast, look at what I get to endure in their afflictions. Believers look ahead and they are strengthened within for the present. Or, or you could look over at, at uh, 1 Peter First Peter three, uh, First Peter four, verse twelve. Uh, four. Let's go four thirteen. Actually, uh, to the degree that we share in the suffering of Christ, we keep rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, we might also rejoice with exaltation. Believers, look ahead. To the degree that I get to suffer with Christ, I rejoice. I rejoice. Because I'm looking forward to the completion that I will enjoy when he comes. Believers look ahead. And it encourages them in the fight and in the struggle of the present. Another silly illustration, but the one that I always think about, is uh, the, the season of 2016 and 2017 in the football world was, for most teams, nondescript. Vikings fan. Nondescript. Packers fan. Nothing, nothing going that year. Because there was, only, there was only two teams in the final game that really mattered. And one of those teams was totally crushing the other team. Matter of fact, by halftime, it was the greatest deficit that one team had ever been under in Super Bowl history. No team had come back from a, uh, a greater score than this team, the Patriots. <laughs> What were the coaches talking about to their team at halftime? What inspired and strengthened the greatest comeback of all time? And I'm sure they did a few X's and O's, which is fancy language for it. You guys are not doing your jobs, idiots. Do this, and then we'll win. But it's said that in the locker room, what were the coaches talking about? They were talking about what it felt like to hold the, Lambo uh, the trophy that the team won. They were talking about how, be careful, it's a lot heavier than you think it's going to be. It's a little top-heavy, actually. You've got to be careful how you hold it because it's so heavy, but yet it also flips over. That's what they were talking about. They were talking about the sweet joy of victory. Now, I don't know if that's what pulled them through or if it was the brilliance of Tom Brady. Macy says it was. But I happen to think focusing on the joy and the reward in the future encourages you and strengthens you for the present. And that's what we're called to do here in James. James 1 verse 4, right? Look at that. Let it have its perfect work. So why? So that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. I want that. I want to be with Jesus possessing those qualities. And even right now in this present life, I want to grow in that. I want to grow in that. I want to grow in that. Let's rejoice 
Let's rejoice in the outworking of trials. But secondly, and moving backwards, let's rejoice in the working of trials. Rejoice in the working of trials. How how is God working? How is this trial working for that end, for that outcome that I so much want? Notice two words in verse 2 and verse 3. Notice first off, when you encounter various trials, and then verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith. Trial in verse 2 refers to putting something under a rigorous test, intense heat perhaps, to test its strength. Uh, testing, it's, it's a similar word, there are similar words, it's, it's, it's referring to the process of proving or revealing the genuine quality of something. And these are words that are used often to refer to what a person who deals with metal does. He puts metal through intense heat. Why? To prove it. To test it. But what is he doing when he's testing the metal? He's actually removing the dross, which is the, the, weak, the weak metal out of it. That actually appeared like it was strong metal. But as soon as you put heat on it, it dissolves and passes that's, that's what it is to test metal. But this actually is a process that strengthens the metal because it removes the impurities and only the strong properties remain. And what is metal that is stronger? It is more valuable. It is more useful. It's been tested. It's, it's, it's trustworthy. I mean, you don't want, you don't want that new coffee cup to go untested. It'll leak all over the place. No, I don't know. That's not. That's a joke. Uh, anyway, but 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 a similar a similar idea is what we do in life all the time. We talk about testing all the time for benefit, and that's what James is talking about here. You you refer to testing a car. What, what does it mean when you are testing a car? It means you're going to drive this thing at its maximum speed and slam on the brakes because you want to see if this car can save you in a terrible situation. You refer to taking a test at school. That means your teacher, if she's evil, is going, and I said she intention. no, I, I don't know. Uh, if, she, if she or he is evil, is going to send you the hardest questions because she wants to see where you're at, how well you know the material. That's what testing does. That's what trials do in a positive sense. They show you weaknesses, but they also strengthen you at the same time. The Bible promises that God tests the faith of his people. And he tests it in various ways. One way in which God tests his people actually is a little surprising to me. He tests us through pleasures. He tests us through pleasures. Uh, Proverbs 27, 21. Look at this verse. This is very interesting considering what we're talking about here. A refining pot is for silver and a furnace for gold And each is tested by the mouth that praises him. You want to see where your heart's really at? You want to see how proud of yourself you are? How do you respond when people praise you? How do you respond? But God also tests his his people Elsewhere in Scripture with pleasure as well, like in Second Chronicles 32, 31, um, he knew the pride that King Hezekiah had. And that's an important thing to remember. God knows. He's not trying to reveal information to himself about you. Man, I wonder, I wonder how that person is doing. I wonder if they're spiritually strong. No, he knows exactly how you are spiritually, but he wants you to know how you're doing spiritually. And this is what God did with Hezekiah. The proud king Hezekiah was tested when men from Babylon came along. It says in 2 Chronicles 32, 31, that God left him alone to find out what was inside of him. What a horrifying thought. If you're not ready for it, that God is testing you through pleasure. That's one way God tests us. But the other way, and the way we're talking about here, is God also tests his people through pain. Once again, this is 1 Peter 3, 12 through 13, all over again. 1 Peter 3 um, says this. Everybody bookmarks wrong. First Peter three 
uh, 12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening. This is how God always treats his people. He sends pain your way to test you. So here's a question for you. Oh, how do you react when life goes south? How do you react when life is difficult, when life is hard, when things don't go your way? Do you get bitter? Do you get angry? Do you start blaming other people in your life? Do you argue? Are you defensive? Are you pitying yourself? How do you react when hard things happen? Or, even though it hurts, even though it's full of pain, you pray more. You start seeking God more. You start begging God to sanctify you through this because you're seeing your weaknesses and your sin come out when you're pressed. Sometimes God puts his people through pain so that they can see it, so that they can know themselves, and so that they can respond. And this is how God is growing you through your trials, if you think about it. God reveals weaknesses sometimes to strengthen you and grow your faith. It's not a pleasant process at all. But that's how God grows faith. Matter of fact, notice notice how God grows faith. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance. You, you grow in perseverance through testing, through all the weaknesses coming out. You increase in your strength to endure and pursue God's will and God's way regardless of the circumstances through painful tests. That's what perseverance means. It means you endure, you stick to God regardless of what your circumstances tell you to do. It's more than patience, which is how this word was um, translated way back in the day in older translations. It's, it's more active than that. You're actively clinging and pursuing God. Matter of fact, I would illustrate it to you this way. Perseverance is not the sailor at the bottom deck of the ship holding on to a pillar persevering through the storm. Hope this is over soon. Hope this is over soon. Hope this is over. That's not perseverance. That's patience, maybe. But that's not perseverance. Perseverance in this word is more like the pilot that's on the deck of the ship holding the steering wheel, sending the boat through the storm because he knows the only way out of this storm is through the storm. That's what perseverance is. I am following God through this storm because that's the only way to faithfully get anything out of this storm. God's working to grow you in your active love, in your active persistence, in your obedience to him even when it hurts. And that's why God brings various trials your way. And what, might, what might rejoicing in God's painful work look like? What might it look like to rejoice when times are tough, when following Jesus costs you? It's you saying to yourself, God, you are showing me what I trust, what I lean on, what I value. God, God that's what you're showing me. Uh, this is my source of comfort. I realize this now because now that this is gone, I am uncomfortable. You are revealing to me what brings stability in my life. Maybe it's, I, I always depend on circumstances going well. That's what brings me joy. I always depend on people liking me. That's what brings me joy. Or I always depend on just having a comfortable, easy, happy-go-lucky life. And now that these things are taken away from me, I realize that my joy is not placed in the right place. God is showing you what you trust, but also uh, God is showing you perhaps also what your values are. What your values are. How do you pray in trial? How do you pray in trouble? 
Are, are, are you the kind of person that prays, like me, <clears throat> Lord, uh, get me out of this? <laughs> it's biblical. I can find a verse. <laughs> or are you someone who has enough sense and wisdom to pray, Lord, would you please grow me through this? Lord, please grow me through this. Here's the catch about trials and growth. And this is very important. Write this down. Trials will only benefit you as you submit yourself to God through them. Trials are of no use to you if you do not submit yourself to God in them. Uh, Look, this is what James is saying. Verse 4, let perseverance have its perfect work. What happens if you don't do that? You don't get the result. You don't get the outcome. But trials are only a benefit to the people that endure, who persist, who cling to God, who plow through the storm, hugging God and loving him regardless of their circumstances. Those are the only kinds of people that benefit from trial. I mean, think about it. Everybody has trials in their life. I I love Job Job 5, verse 7. It's Job's friend, but I still love it. Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. A man is going to experience trouble in their life. They're born for it as sparks go up. You never see sparks go down. Sparks go up. That's how man is. We're born for trouble. So how come, with all of the trouble, with all of the trials, with all of the difficulties in our world, nobody is benefiting from it? Because nobody is submitting themselves to God in it. Nobody is saying to God, God, show me me. And I will respond accordingly by your word. Nobody benefits from trials these days. And there are so many trials in our world. Nobody is saying, God, show me me. But that brings us to verse 2. We rejoice in the outcome of our trials, verse 4. We rejoice in the working of our trials, verse 3. And this brings us all to how we approach trials. And guess what, blessed ones? This is critical. If you don't start with verse 2, nothing else works. So finally, number 3, rejoice in the face of trials. Rejoice in in the face of trials, the encounter of trials, the experience of trials in your life. Remember who James is writing to? He's writing to Jewish Christians who are suffering for doing something good, for following Jesus. And he's writing to them, say, hey, this trial is bringing out spiritual immaturity in you. Hey, this trial is bringing out your your tendencies of worldliness in you. And he's calling them to here rejoice in their trials. He's calling them here to consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Real real quick, little technical details there. When you encounter is is, is is an an expression of, of basically whenever you encounter. You will surely encounter sooner or later. So count it all joy because you're going to encounter essentially. And, and the word encounter is kind of interesting. It's used in um, the story of the, the Good Samaritan when the man falls among, thorn, uh, falls among robbers. Or it's used in Acts to talk about Paul's boat falling into a storm. And it's kind of like when you encounter something that you don't want. Uh, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Notice, you are not called to be going out seeking trials in your life. I'm going to try to be an idiot so people will give me trials and that will grow my faith. That's not what the Bible ever calls you to do. No, it's saying when it happens, and believe me it will, you are to consider it all joy. And the word various trials, those two words right there, are also interesting. Various, the word, of course, refers to something that's diverse, multifaceted. It's used in the Old Testament to talk about multicolored things, the spots of a leopard or a multicolored coat, perhaps, in the Greek, right? And and the idea here is that there's all sorts of ways that might test and try your faith. There is a variety of things that will come your way that will test and try and prove your faith. 
It might not be a huge thing. It might be a collection of all sorts of little things. It might be a sickness that is trying your faith. It might be a migraine that is trying your faith. It might be a person or people that are trying your faith. It might be a schedule. It might be bereavement or a funeral. It might be loneliness or disappointment. There might be all sorts of ways that your faith is being tried, but it will be various. It will be various ways. And, and, and it's helpful for you to remember that God doesn't have a cookie-cutter approach for trials in your life. Just because you aren't suffering the way the person next to you is suffering doesn't mean you're any better or any less. It doesn't seem to suggest to me that only the people that have intense trials grow. It doesn't seem to suggest to me that only the people with huge trials grow. No, everyone grows based on how they respond to their various trials. Your, your question that you face is not, man, I, I could handle their trials so much better than they could, but it's how am I handling the life that God has given me and called me to be faithful in right here? You have a unique set of circumstances in your life, a unique set of hardships, and you, my friend, are called to be faithful to Jesus even in those circumstances. But remember, those circumstances are crafted by the perfect, powerful hand of God. But notice uh, one final, very important piece. And by final, I mean like 17. Five. Uh, Christians aren't called to a fatalistic, gloomy kind of outlook in their trials. Uh, We're not called to be, well, I'm going to suffer. So let's get on with it, like Eeyore. Now, that's how Muslims go through trials. They're very fatalistic in their understanding of how the world works. This is the will of God. I can do nothing about it. But notice also here, Christians aren't called to either being stoic or indifferent or unfeeling in our various trials. Uh, Christians are not supposed to be people that are like, I choose not to feel. I, in my head, refuse to believe that this trial exists. I don't believe in pain. That's not a Christian response. I'll tell you, who does believe that? Buddhists believe that. They believe if they can eventually get to a point where they don't care about anything anymore, that they will achieve the ultimate sanctification, when I feel nothing. That, to me, is called dead. (laughs) But notice this also. Christians aren't called to a continual laughing happiness either. Christians aren't called to always be happy in their circumstances automatically. Christians are not supposed to have this continual laughter about them. I call that annoying. No, Christians are called to do something very real. We are called to consider it all joy. What is joy? Joy is a persistent belief that God is wise And that God is powerful. Joy is a persistent belief that God in his wisdom and in his power is totally in control of my situation. Joy is a stubborn belief that God is operating all things for his glory and my ultimate good. Joy is confidence, as our pastor would say. Confidence in providence. And notice, uh, this joy is all. I am confident in every circumstance, in every challenge, in every situation, that my God is strong and that my God is wise and that this is not messing with his plan. It always assumes that God is in control. It always assumes that God is at work. That is joy. This is a part of the plan. There's nothing that is 
fooling God in this. Or, or to say it negatively, and perhaps this will sound weird, but this really helps me think through it, right? It always, despite the deepest pain or the darkest confusion, Christian joy persists in giving God the benefit of the doubt. Maybe God isn't wrong. Maybe God is right. Maybe God is wise. Maybe this is a part of his plan, even though I can't see it. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, because last time I checked, he is wiser and more powerful than me. And regardless of my circumstances, I'm going to trust that God is still God. That is joy. That is Christian joy. I don't know how or why God is doing this, but I'm going to choose to trust him anyway. And I'm going to have incredible hope because I know he's working for his glory and my good. But notice this, this this joy, this all joyness is not automatic. I mean, last time I checked, an imperative meant I got to do something here. And that's what verse 2 is saying. You need to do something. You need to consider it all joy. I actually need to deliberately, persistently, thoroughly, actively put on something in my thinking. And that is how I consider my situation. Believers don't believe um, that pain, the trial, the trouble, the difficulty is just automatically good. Uh, Believers don't necessarily believe that, right? We, we believe that the effects of sin in our world, the things that cause trials and troubles are actually not good because it's the effects of the fall. This is not a good thing. This trial, this hardship, this death is not good. Anybody that tells you that death is natural and normal is, does not have a Christian worldview. Death is wrong. Death is, is a product of the fall and sin, and I am praying to Jesus to return soon to reverse the curse. No, no, uh, believers don't just say, don't just say, hey, all things are good. No, believers are called, this is tricky, to have all joy by choosing to consider something about God in all of their circumstances and all of their trials. They're they're choosing to consider that God has certain aims in what he's working on. God has certain ends in his work. And they're choosing to consider God and have joy in God. That's what considering means. It means to make a value judgment about something. It means to interpret something in your life a certain way. I'm going to choose to interpret this situation this way. I'm considering this. Now, for the natural person, what does the natural person do in every single situation? I am going to consider this situation according to my feelings and my circumstances and my understanding. And I'm going to grumble and complain and argue and be bitter and defend myself to the end. But the spiritual person considers the working of God and can respond in all Joy. Matter of fact, the Christian, for the Christian, trials and troubles, get this, are not pains, but they're great privileges. They're great opportunities, are they not? God is, in his wisdom, growing me. This is not a liability. But this only comes to you as you persist, as you persist in trials. And you want to know something incredible? Like I said, it was the last point that had thousands of points. When you do this, when you persist in trials like this, God supernaturally strengthens your joy and your persistence. When you choose to trust God, God strengthens your faith. And not just by removing weaknesses, but also by strengthening you supernaturally through his power. Uh, Colossians says this, Colossians 1, Paul prays for the Colossians. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God. 
being, verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Patience and steadfastness come from God through prayer, from humble people. That's where patience and steadfast really come. Finally, the the scene of John Patton on his desert island with his entire family underneath him, six feet down in the ground, is, is very poignant to me, very striking to me. I've been reading this biography about him lately, and I just wanted to read you some of his words, um, some of his words about that day. As he was considering his life, he, he wrote this, Let those who have ever passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me, as for all others. It would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. That spot, that Grave spot became my sacred and much frequented shrine during all the following months and years when I labored on for the salvation of these savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers, and strength and death. That was his sacred spot, he says. But then he he writes this, But for Jesus and the fellowship that he vouchsafed for me, I must have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. Notice. Strength, endurance was not easy, but for Jesus, I persisted. I continued. And even he says this when he's reflecting on why he did this. Many missionaries came to him and said, maybe you should take a break. Maybe you should take some time off. Patton writes this. As he persisted, feeling unmovably assured that my God and Father was too wise and too loving to err in anything that he does or permits, I looked up to the Lord for help and struggled on in his work. What was Patton leaning on? The way Patton got through his trial was to say to himself again and again through tears, my God is too wise and too loving to err. So I will persist on in what he has called me to do. And what was the result of this? Patton had an extraordinary ministry. And it actually increased after he left the island. Suddenly he had this great ministry opportunity of inspiring other Christians to engage in missions, whether it's giving to missions or it's becoming missionaries themselves. And he said this, oftentimes while passing through the perils and defeats of my first four years in the mission field of Tana, I wondered why God permitted such things. But on looking back now, I can clearly perceive that the Lord was thereby preparing me for the best work of all my life namely the kindling of the heart of Australian Presbyterianism with a living affection for these islanders and their own southern seas. God is doing a great work through trials, but only insofar as we follow him, trusting in him, believing in him, clinging to him, and persisting in faith in our great, wise, and powerful God. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, I thank you for this evening, and I pray that you would bless us through our conversation one with another. I pray that we would be an encouragement to one another and also a source of strengthening and comfort even in talking about trials in our life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.